good evening to each one of you. If you would, open to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 is where we'll pick up this evening. Matthew chapter 9. I want us to pick up here in verses 35 through 38. Thankful for the presence of all who are here this evening. Thankful for the opportunity to come here to worship together and encourage one another. In Matthew chapter 9, let's pick up here in verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Matthew chapter 9 helps introduce us to the very heart of Jesus. He has gone from town to town. He's preaching the gospel. He's been healing their sick. And while he's doing this, verse 36 points out that he sees the people out there and he has compassion on them. It's one of those, those inner feelings, one of those deep feelings that he has of concern for them. And he views them as distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. If you have ever seen a sheep maybe off by itself, it's just kind of lost. It's kind of frazzled. And he saw, the, he saw the flocks or saw the people in a way that was similar to that. Jesus knew the condition that they were in without a shepherd. He knew that these people were lost, that they had wandered away from the Lord. And then he knows also in verse 37 that the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. So what's the solution? The solution is there in verse 38, to pray to the Lord, pray to the Father, that he would send out workers into his harvest. That's what he was wanting, to have people that would go out and to have the same type of feeling, to then try to lead these people to the Lord. You know, whenever you look, the response that Jesus wants from his disciples for you and me is not only to work, but to also to talk to the Lord about this. We've talked about this in the past, about praying for the lost. But he wanted more people to help in that process. But also turn over to Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, while we are introduced to the heart of Jesus, that he views the lost with compassion, that he wants others to come along and to help in that work, what you'll notice in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 is that this goes back to Jesus' purpose. His very purpose is identified here in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 where he says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's how Jesus was going to be completing his message. It was like Matthew 9 and also here in Luke chapter 19. It was through teaching the gospel. There was no other way. That was the only way he was going to accomplish it. It is by spreading that message. And that's exactly what he's doing here with Zacchaeus. So with all this being said, there's no other way. It was going to be Jesus' words. Remember in John chapter 6 and verse 63, Jesus is there speaking with a multitude. And what does he say about his words? That they are spirit and they are life. That's the only way. In John chapter 8 and verse 23, or I'm sorry, verse 32, he mentions that he would communicate the truth to them, that they would be his disciples, and that truth would set them free. And also in John 8 and verse 24, he said, Unless you believe in me, you will die in your sins. He was serious. He knew that there was no other option. It was only Jesus. It was only the spoken message that he was communicating. And he was so serious about this salvation, about your and mine and the whole world's salvation, that John 3.16 points it out, that God sent his son to die on the cross for you and for me so that all would be forgiven, all that could be saved. You know, the thing is, there's nothing new in those statements, is there? You know, you've heard however many sermons, and you've probably heard almost every single one of those statements. Do you ever feel like you're inadequate in living up to the life that Jesus wants for you in this way? I know I do. When I look at what the Lord wants for the lost and how he wants us to go and to reach the lost, I feel like many times I'm not doing as much as I could. Maybe you feel the same way. 
So what I want us to talk about tonight is about, as we continue our series on taking on the challenge to be like Jesus, we're going to continue discussing this concept, but we're going to discuss tonight about reaching out to lost souls like Jesus. And we're going to step through some of this this evening. So what I want you to do is turn over to John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, that's where we'll be picking up for the first section of our lesson. In John chapter 4, what we must first do is identify some of what Jesus did. Obviously, it was Jesus' overriding purpose. It was his overriding mission to come and to seek the lost. That was something that was constantly on his mind. It was constantly there that he was was driving at. We've mentioned in the past about he wanted to do the Father's will. Well, what is the Father's will? It's going back to this same concept of man being saved. But you'll notice in John chapter 4, we could go through... And if time allows, perhaps in the future I'll do a lesson on John chapter 4 because there's so much in it, but I want us to just get a snapshot of it tonight. But I want us to learn from Jesus at the well about how to reach the lost. And in John chapter 4, we're going to pick up here in verse 5. You know, the truth is evangelism in the real world is really hard, isn't it? You know, as I look at the audience and I, I see all the people that are out here, I've got everybody looking at me. Everybody came here voluntarily. They've got their Bibles in front of them, and they are eager to hear. Well, maybe not completely eager. (laughs) I hope you're eager. (laughs) But uh, eager to hear what I have to say about what the Bible says. When you go out in the world, it's not that way, is it? You have people that aren't really interested in hearing the Word. They're interested in telling you maybe what they think about the Word, but they're not in the same position. You know, it's easy to talk about it here, But whenever we go back and look at Jesus, he's giving us an example of what it's like in the real world, of how to deal with that. And in John chapter 4, just four simple things that you notice about Jesus here. You learn from Jesus in John 4 that first off, he is looking for opportunities. Look here in John 4 and verse 5. He has been passing through, he's going, I believe he's on his way to Jerusalem, and he passes through Samaria. And you'll notice here in verse 5. Then he came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. You know, a lot of times we feel like we don't have that many opportunities to share the gospel. But I think as you look here at John chapter 4, what you see is Jesus in an ordinary situation, don't you? He's going and he's getting water. It's his normal, pretty normal routine, just going and getting water. And even then you could say, well, he's tired too on top of all this. But what you see with Jesus is that he is looking for an opportunity. He understands the importance of what he's doing, and he's trying to see some type of way that he can get into it. Many times we may feel like we, we, don't, we don't have opportunities, but perhaps maybe it's because we don't recognize them, or perhaps we're not looking for them. We've got to go back and kind of train our eyes a little bit and start looking for those opportunities. We need to look at the world and, and try to see ways that we can share the truth with someone, and you see that with Jesus here. But also look here in John 4, here in verse 9. In John 4, here in verse 9, You'll notice that he is meeting here with a Samaritan woman, but look at the relationships that the Samaritans have. In verse 9, he says, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You know, the next thing that you see, not only is Jesus looking for opportunities, he's overcoming obstacles. Whenever you think about a lot of times, whenever we're going through, and I I have this just like you do, uh, maybe you're in a restaurant and you got somewhere to be, don't you? Or perhaps you've got, uh, maybe it's it's not a good time, your your hands are full or whatever the case may be. It's just on and on and on, there seems like obstacles. And this woman could not be more of an obstacle. First off, think about here in John chapter 4. Jesus is a Jew, and talking to a woman as a rabbi... That was nonsense. You didn't do that. That's not what the rabbis did. They didn't deal with women or children. But then also, Jews didn't have any dealings with the Samaritans. But did he let that stop them? No. 
He still kept pressing. But also think about this woman. It would have been already an uncomfortable situation for him being a Jew talking with a woman. But think probably, as you look at this woman, she's probably not well off compared to Jesus. I mean, not that Jesus really had a whole lot going for him, but you still had some differences in economics sometimes that keep us and say, well, maybe that person is too poor, maybe that person is too rich. They're not going to hear me either way. Sometimes we let that get in the way. Perhaps maybe it's a poor home life. We know something about that person. Maybe they've been divorced or or on and on and on. And we say, well, that person's not going to be interested. But you look at this woman, how many husbands did she have? She had five, didn't she? I mean, she didn't, Jesus doesn't say, well, okay, that person's not going to hear. And then he just keeps on going. That's not how he operated. He was still going to overcome obstacles. This woman, clearly from the text, my understanding is that she is living with someone, so she has immorality on top of this. And there's all kinds of differences between the Jewish upbringing and the Samaritan upbringing. Brethren, if we get honest with ourselves, if Jesus wanted an excuse for not talking to this woman, you think it was there? It was there. But he didn't take it. He was willing to overcome those obstacles. You know, what we need to do is the same thing here. So we don't need to let those obstacles stop us. We need to be willing to take the time and be willing to overcome those things in order to try to bring something about. But also pick up here in verse 10. In verse 10, what you'll notice reading down through verse 15. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of water, springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. The next thing that you'll notice that Jesus is very, very good about is that he has seen opportunities, he's not letting obstacles stop him, but he is able to transition the topic. You're here just talking about something normal, something just water, just everyday things, but yet he is willing to then take it to something much, much more about a water that will never go away, an everlasting water. He's transitioning it, and he's thinking of a different way. Whenever we think about these things, maybe you can go through, you got someone you're talking to about the weather. Well, guess who arranges the weather? God does, doesn't he? It's a great day that the Lord's blessed us with, or whatever the case may be. You're sitting there talking about politics and everything like that. But who's in command? Who's in control of what this world does? Isn't it God? There's a transition that you can do. Brethren, we just need to get creative. You know, one great thing about human beings is that we can be creative when we need to be, right? You know what they say, necessity is what? The mother of invention, isn't it? And if we start seeing it as a necessity to try to reach people with a loss, to try to come up with ways to communicate with them, I believe with our creative ability, we can do that. But we need to learn and try to practice this ability of transitioning to a spiritual topic. But one thing that you'll notice also is that while he looked for opportunities, he overcame obstacles, and he transitioned the topic, he also tried to accomplish something concrete. You'll notice picking up in verse 16. Let's read down through verse 26. He said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. 
For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, the disciples come back, and then they're questioning what Jesus is doing. But what you see with Jesus is he doesn't just leave it up in the air. He accomplishes something concrete. He goes through and he's trying to get to a certain point with this lady. And he continues on the dialogue. He didn't end in some vague way or general way, say, well, it's good. it was good talking with you. Or, you know, this was a real good conversation. He doesn't do that. He had a specific action that he wanted. And brethren, when we talk to people, I think a lot of times we just leave it open. We say, well, it's good talking with you, or it's been a good discussion, and then we just walk away from a good discussion. We need to have something concrete we do, maybe an invite to a specific service. Can I see you Sunday? Can I see you next Sunday? Whatever the case may be. Or perhaps to a study, or whatever the case may be, identify something specific that you're trying to compel them to, instead of something that is just open and general. You know, the point is, despite all the differences... This woman was willing to talk, and she's receptive, she's intelligent, and she's willing to listen to it. But many Christians would have overlooked it because of all the obstacles that were there in the first place. You know, of all these people, you know, you might not think, well, why would she listen? But look at what this woman was willing to do down here in verse 39. It says, From that city many of the Samaritans believed in him, Because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I have done. What would have happened if Jesus hadn't said anything to her? Would the whole town have responded? I mean, perhaps, maybe Jesus went in there. But it's because of what that woman testified of that many, many other people came. You know, Ann Stevens is quoted as saying this, You can never count the apples in a seed. Think about that. You have one seed, but how many apples are going to come from that? You'll never know, but you have to extend to that one person, one unlikely candidate here in John chapter 4, but yet a whole city is willing to listen to Jesus because of it. Even someone we would cast off. You know, there's a lot that we can learn about Jesus. I mean, you could go on to multiple, multiple cases for how he deals with the loss, but this is just a snapshot. But brethren, the truth is, when we look at Jesus, we see someone that is, that is trying to understand and, and understands his purpose, and he understands where these people are. He understands that it's not just moral relativity. He understands it's ultimatum or not. It's either him or you're lost. And he's trying to communicate that to them. So as we think about Jesus at the well, and what we've seen already in Matthew 9 and also in Luke chapter 19, what we can do also is, while we've learned from Jesus at the well, we need to go back and learn from our excuses. You know, the real question that we need to examine is this. Are we actually doing this work? You know, if I laid a bar up here and we were saying... Uh, Maybe you can fill it up with your percentage from 0 to 100%. How much are you involved in this work? Maybe 25%? Maybe 50%? 75%, 100%? How involved are you in the process of trying to teach others? Because as you think about your friends, how many of your friends, specifically your friends, not mine or any other, how many of them have you tried to, to tell them about Jesus and that they have obeyed the gospel and become Christians? You know, those are questions that I can't answer for you, but you have to answer them, and I have to answer them for myself. I mean, think of three of your closest friends. You know, perhaps these are people that you've known for years. Maybe you've tried to talk to them or whatever the case may be, but three of your closest friends that aren't Christians. How often do you think about them being lost? Because it's where they are. I mean, is it almost never? Never even crosses my mind. Or maybe on occasion, whenever the preacher talks about evangelism or something like that. Or is it something that's on your mind? 
You're concerned about it. It's something that's bothering you, that your friends aren't responding to the gospel. How often do you try to talk to them about the gospel? Is it almost never or maybe on occasion? Or is it, hey, I try to talk to them every time I can. Think about this and over in Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians chapter 4. As we're trying to get a gauge of where we are in some of just our very closest relationships. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul lays this fact out. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of God, for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Paul was Paul's speaking here, and he understands, hey, I want brethren to pray for me. I need to be praying about this so that I can have opportunities and that I can communicate clearly to them. So as you think about as well, how often do you pray for doors of opportunity with these just these three people? Is it frequent? You do it all the time? Is it just on occasion or it's just something that never crosses your mind? Those are questions that you and I have to answer. But when we think about our responses, how do you feel about it? You feel good? If not, why not? Because a lot of times what happens then is we start rolling out the excuses, don't we? We start saying, well, it was a difficult situation. Or we start laying out all kinds of different things. And some of those may be legitimate. But, you know, sometimes we'll say things like, you know, I never have an opportunity to talk to them about spiritual things. Well, Doesn't Jesus show us how to make an opportunity? I mean, of all the things that we make opportunities to talk about, wouldn't we think, you know, the salvation of someone's soul would be something to make an opportunity to talk about? Some people may say, well, I don't know what to say if I was presented with the opportunity. Well, turn over to Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, you have a man that has been demon-possessed. He's... He's a Jew, but look at what he communicates. He's healed by the Lord. In, John, in Luke chapter 8, here and in verse 39, instead of going through and laying out all these different things, what I would like for each of us to do is simply this. He wanted to go with Jesus after he had been healed and, and had the demons removed. Look at what Jesus told him to do. Return to your house. And describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. And as Jesus returned, the people welcomed him, for they had all been waiting for him. You know, you may not know everything. I don't know everything either. But we do know what God's done for us, don't we? You know, we, have the, we know the fact that our sins have been forgiven. We know how we went about that process. We know that the Lord gives us hope and joy every day. Those are things that the world is looking for, that we can just tell them what's happening in our life. But perhaps also we say, well, I don't think that they will listen. Well, in Isaiah 55, if you would turn there, in Isaiah 55 and verse 11. What happens with a lot of these is we start thinking on our terms as opposed to what the Lord wants. And we go to this passage all the time to maybe talk about issues regarding authority and things like that. But pick up here in Isaiah 55 here in verse 8. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. You see what he's saying? saying, God knows best. 
And a lot of times, whenever we come to our excuses, we're following the way we want to think instead of the way that the Lord is thinking. And there in Isaiah 55 and verse 11, the point is, whether they hear it or not, the Lord's will is accomplished whenever the word is communicated. But if we don't communicate the word, then that's where the problem is. We have to at least give them the opportunities. Truth is, we can be very much like Moses, right? Whenever he is called by the Lord to go and to speak to Pharaoh, what does he start doing? Well, I can't speak. And well, can you get somebody else? And we go on and on and on. Brethren, we don't need to do that. The work is too, the work is too important and our excuses are too debilitating. Just causes us to where we're just unable to do anything because of our excuses. What we need to do then is when we look at Jesus, we understand we need to learn from him at the well. We need to look at our excuses and see if they're legitimate and understand, hey, is this, is this a legitimate thing? But then we also need to learn to overcome our fears. You know, perhaps instead of offering excuses, really our problem goes back to fear. We're afraid of them. We're afraid of what's going to happen. We're afraid of, of what people may say. You know, if you went through and laid out the top five fears of what people have uh, regarding sharing the gospel, I'm sure you could have a long list of what people are afraid of. You know, public speaking is one of the things that people are more scared of than death. I think sometimes we could say even evangelism is put in that same way. We're afraid to death of it. You know, you might say, well, I'm afraid that they will say no. Or I'm afraid that they'll shun me from the group. I'm afraid they'll hate me. I'm afraid of not knowing the answer. Or I'm afraid of being made a fool. Does it sound familiar? I think sometimes we're just afraid, aren't we? You know, the work is so frightening because obviously there's some hard times. I don't want to mistake that. But if it's so scary, why should we do it? Well, let me just give you some snapshots. Turn to John 3 and verse 16. Let's run through a few passages to help us remind ourselves of why we do this. In John 3 here in verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The Lord loved the world. He gave his most precious possession that whoever believes in him doesn't have to perish. The world's going to perish without him. But in contrast to perishing, they can have eternal life. Do you believe it? It's right there, one of the most common passages that we know. Turn to 1 Timothy in chapter 2. Jesus willingly came and he died for the salvation of all mankind. It's what we see from John chapter 3. In 1 Timothy 2 here in verses 3 and 4. He says, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants salvation for every single person, whether the color, whether the economic status, whether they made a mess of their life, or whether they've got it all together. He wants everybody to save. Everybody saved. It's in the Bible. Do you believe it? Look over in Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, here in verse 18. In Matthew 28, here in verse 18. Jesus has died so that all men could be saved. He has come so that salvation can be for every single person. And in Matthew 28, in verse 18, Jesus speaking with his apostles. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Obviously, specifically promised to the apostles, but do you believe those facts? That all authority is given to Jesus. That means he has the right to command you to do things and expect you to do them. Do you think he was serious there about sending out his disciples so that all people would be saved? And do you believe the fact in verse 20 that he is there with you to the end of the age? It's written in scripture, but do you believe it? Continue over to Matthew chapter 9 again. In Matthew chapter 9. In 
in Matthew chapter 9 to refresh our minds again, picking up in verse 36. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Do you believe that the harvest is plentiful? And do you believe that the desire is that the Lord wants more people to do it? It's written in Scripture. Do you believe it? Turn over to Rome to Acts this time in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8 here in verse 4, These people had taken the Lord at His word. They had understood what Jesus had done in John 3. They understood, 1 Timothy 2, that He wanted all people to come to a knowledge of the truth. And in Matthew 28, that He was expecting them to go and to make disciples. What you see the early church doing here in chapter 8 is this. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Is that what Christians do? Yes, it is. Turn over to Romans, this time in Romans chapter 3. In Romans 3 here in verse 23, Paul says simply this, For all have sinned and fall short of of the glory of God. In Romans 6, this time in verse 23, he says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you think that sin that is unrepented of, that is not changed, that is not washed away by the blood of Jesus, will cause someone to lose their soul? Romans says it's going to happen. Do we take the Lord at His word? Do we believe it? Turn back to chapter 1 this time in verse 16. In Romans 1 here in verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Do you believe the gospel to be a powerful message by which you yourself will be saved and whoever else wants to come and obey it will be saved? Do you believe it? That's the thing. You've heard these verses for years, but do you believe them? Two more. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 here in verse 10. Do you believe that men will be lost if they do not change from their sin and that the gospel is the only way that men can be saved, the good news of Jesus? And then also in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for the deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Do you believe there's going to be a judgment? where the righteous and the unrighteous will be separated? One last passage along this line. Turn to Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Peter simply says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's reality. That's the world that we live in, whether the world wants to acknowledge it or not. But as Christians, we look at these facts and we must understand and believe them with every fiber of our being. Because that's who Jesus, that's what Jesus did. He understood every one of these. And he understood that's exactly what he wanted for his disciples. So how can we overcome these fears? You look at the top five fears, and we understand here's, the, here's how you overcome fear. It's with the Word of God. You start looking and understanding what the Lord wants. But then how can we overcome these fears? You know, many of our fears aren't really that justified, or we should really just say, you know what, I'm not going to let that affect me. Because look at what the disciples were going to go through. In Luke chapter 10, you know, in response to the the saying, well, I'm afraid that they will say no. Well, in Luke chapter 10 here in verse 16, 
Jesus simply tells them, you know what, it's going to happen. People are going to tell you no. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 16, he says, The one who listens to me, who listens to you, listens to me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. The thing is, we take it personal. It's not personal to you and me. It's personal to Christ whenever they want to to turn away, whenever they are rejecting us. You know, maybe we're afraid that people are going to shun us and not receive us. Well, look here in Luke chapter 10 again in verse 10 this time. Even the dust of your city which clings to our feet we wipe off and protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Oh, I'm sorry, in verse 10. But whatever city you enter, and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, what I read in verse 11. What is he saying? People are going to shun you. People are not going to receive your word. But you press on anyway, because the mission is greater. People are going to hate you. That's what Matthew 10 says. So if you're afraid that they're going to hate you, well, it's going to be a reality. They're going to hate you. You know, if you're afraid that you're not going to know the answer, well, that's just part of it sometimes. You just don't know the answer. But isn't it the Holy Spirit and His Word that gives us the answers? You know, what are we afraid of? And perhaps we're afraid of being made a fool by someone. Well, sometimes that's just going to happen because you just don't know. But that's no excuse for giving up. You know, whatever you think of Nelson Mandela, he has some good things to say about courage. He said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who feels, who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. What the Lord wants is courageous followers who say, I'm going to serve God more than I care about what people are going to say. So the truth is we can overcome these fears by having faith and confidence in God and looking at Jesus as our example, say, that's who I'm going to be. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to share the gospel and do those four things we talked about. I'm going to grow in his word, and I'm going to realize there's something so much greater in this life. It's worth everything that I have to offer. One last passage back in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, I want us to end with this text. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The question is, Do you believe it? Do you believe the gospel is God's power to be saved? Do you believe that you are in a dying world where people will lose their soul, they'll lose themselves for eternity, and that there is no other way for men to be saved, and that the only message that can save them is this message? Do you believe it? The thing is, I want you to believe it. But whether you believe it or not, It doesn't change anything. It's fact. And the thing is, Jesus knew that importance. And he knew the importance of reaching lost souls, and he had compassion on them. And he wants that for you and me as well. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we come to you at this time thankful for this day and the time to look into your word at your son Jesus and his his overarching drive and purpose. We're humbled by the fact that you love us so much and can call us children of you. We're thankful for this time to to look at his example, and we ask that you help us to overcome our excuses, to overcome our fears, and to be bold to bring forth your life-giving word. Help us as we strive to serve you, Father. In Christ's name, amen. If you're subject to the invitation today, we definitely want to extend that to you. We don't want to have any service where we don't do that. If you're not a Christian, we bring you this message of salvation. Where Jesus came, he died, as we've laid out. But the response for us is to believe, to say, hey, that did actually happen. I'm willing to change my life and repent. And if you believe it, will you confess him? Will you say, I have faith in him, I believe in him? 
and be immersed and be obedient to his will for the remission of your sins and start walking faithfully with him. Perhaps you're a Christian and you realize, hey, there's some things that I need to correct. Don't leave today without doing that. If we can help you at all, come forward as we stand and sing.